We have an interesting subject this morning, one which has perturbed human thinking for thousands of years, and that is the effort to discover what the rules are behind the evolutions of living things. What is the plan? Now, some, of course, deny that there is a plan. This is a convenient answer, but no solution. Others believe that this plan is in the keeping of a divine power and that no mortal will ever be able to fathom this mystery of the Godhead. There are others, however, many devout and formed persons, who feel that while it is probably true that the ultimate and infinite answer to all questions is not av- are not available at this time, that by a careful and thoughtful consideration of the processes now functioning in nature, we can come to a pretty good approximation of the rules behind the game. We have a panorama of life which has been strengthened and broadened and deepened by anthropology, uh, by uh, zoology, archaeology, and practically every research instrument that man has devised. From these various sources, we derive accounts of living and life. We find how things move forward through time. We observe, perhaps, if we are thoughtful, the correlations between cause and effect. And out of a simple and quiet meditation upon what is visible and knowable to us, we begin to recognize that destiny is a pattern, not a series of incidents or accidents. The processes of destiny seemingly are continuous. They are immutable. The most important of all things is the process itself with which all life becomes involved. The more we know about the destiny of life, the better we can cooperate with it every day. And there are some who suspect that man has been given a mind in order that he may use it to think about the reason for himself. That while most persons use the mind simply to advance some important detail of their own, behind the thinking power is the energy necessary to contemplate, at least in part, the unfoldment of this thing called destiny. We are in the same relationship with another word called fate. Now, fate has been associated with fatalism or fatalistic circumstances. And this idea that there is a fatal necessity against which we cannot revolt and which we cannot transmute or transform within ourselves has led to religious fatalism, which is particularly obvious in the faith of Islam in which fatalism is a central doctrine. It is is part of the principle upon which the faith is built. Now, fate, to the average person, has become almost synonymous with luck. Fate is something that happens for no obvious or practical reason, or the cause of it is something we do not wish to investigate. A good many things that happen to us we accept with reluctance, but we do not wish to try to understand why they happen. The reason we are reluctant to explore the causes of occurrences is that they would almost certainly remind us of defects in our own character we would gradually be forced to recognize that ill fortune has to be earned. That it is earned by doing the wrong thing, sometimes with a good spirit and a fine hope. 
But if it's the wrong thing, it will not work. Therefore, it would appear that faith, particularly, is the ex expression of man's experimenting with the processes of living. Faith comes to us as a result of observing our own actions, or observing the actions of others or of nations, and observing how closely uh, the effects follow their causes. There are broad patterns of, we might say, fatalism, uh, expounded by the teachings of Oswald Spengler, who points out that there is a constant relationship between events and that similar causes always produce similar consequences. The consequences may be modified by time or place and will differ in detail because of na nations or races or cultural structures. But in essence, a certain action will inevitably produce an, a correspondingly significant reaction. War, therefore, must result in war, not in peace. And why, then, do we say that this law of destiny is essentially benevolent? Because if war must always produce war, then war is eternal. And this we do not believe. If every mistake that we make results in another catastrophe from which we have learned nothing and about which we make no thoughtful consideration, then the vicious circles of circumstances must go on indefinitely. They will not go on, however, forever. Indefinitely means for a time, because man is so constituted in himself that he cannot enjoy suffering forever. The mere thought of suffering in a purgatory or perdition forever is too much for him. And it is also obvious that the average person does desire to be comfortable. He wants to be as pleasant as conditions permit. He would like to live in a peaceful world and in a cooperative society. Because when he gets a taste of these benefits, he likes them. But unfortunately, his own character will not maintain his desire or his intention. He drops back into being what he has always been, and that is a competitive creature. He has not yet had enough suffering to realize that suffering is due to wrong action, that there is no possible way, scientifically, religiously, or philosophically, that the individual can make a mistake without paying for it. Now, the like to hope that this point is not as severe as it sounds. We like to hope that we can do as we please, and that all will come out well. This is possible only in a person so enlightened that what he pleases to do is the greatest good for himself and everyone else. Until this is the basis of his pleasure, pleasure will alternate with displeasure down through time. The individual facing the consequences of his own conduct, has developed a considerable literature on the subject, much of which we call history. Now, history for most persons is a boresome subject. It is also a very unpleasant one. For the most part, modern histories are accounts and repetitions of the delinquencies of mankind. They contain the constant record of our mistakes. They show the inevitable consequences of man's inhumanity to his own kind and to other forms in nature. Everywhere history tells us 
that we are making mistakes and we keep right on making them. We have not yet realized that history is a kind of scripture. It has a sacred meaning, for it tells us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Now, when we study what we should do and what we should not do, uh, we are reminded of a concept of Gator, in which he points out that there are two selves or two souls or two individualities inside of each of us. One of these is forever struggling toward the good, and the other is constantly struggling towards the gratification of appetites. Now, an appetite is not necessarily limited to food intake. An appetite is a desire of any kind that satisfies, satisfies an appetite within ourselves. Uh, we can say that cupidity is an appetite. Jealousy is an appetite. Because in each case, we are catering to something which we want to use to satisfy non-constructive attitudes. So according to Gator, every individual is a divided person. Every individual has something in himself that is aspiring to union with the eternal, something that should transcend all limitation and all material uh, shortcomings. This something that is striving for perfection is an idealism in ourselves. It is probably the basis of qualms of conscience. It also is constantly reminding us that we could do things better. It may impel us to unselfishness or to kindliness or recommend that we forgive our enemies. But the other being within ourselves is highly personal. If we have difficulties with others, this lower being does not wish to forgive or forget. It wishes to revenge. It wants to do an ill turn for every ill turn that is done to it. It wishes to re revenge itself upon life, upon people. And where it cannot pick out an individual to be the subject or object of its revenge, it turns against society as a whole, trying desperately to get back at the world for any suffering that occurs to itself. So these two struggling within us constitute a basis of most persons' compound dispositions. Now in some, that spot which is struggling toward the beautiful and the good is a little dominant. It's, it's making headway. It is becoming more and more involved in decisions, making these decisions more kind, more gentle, more forgiving. Then, with others, the other type of attitude, the negative being, is gaining strength because of disillusionments, uh, because of frustrations, and simply because the individual is becoming more and more centered upon the gratification of his personal appetites and desires. One thing, of course, that complicates the whole issue is the circle of the unknown uh, which is drawn around the lives of all of us. We live in the midst of a circle, and there is a wall beyond which we cannot see and we cannot even guess with complete accuracy. Everyone, therefore, lives within this environment and is dominated by it. In this environment, there are certain fallacies that have become almost canonical. We regard them as scriptural. We regard some of these fallacies as little less than of divine origin, when in reality they are not. Among the fallacies, of course, is that we must build in our entire way of life upon the program for the 70, 80, 90 years of our present embodiments. Everything that we can possibly do to gratify ourselves must be done while we're here. After we're not here, what happens is a very dim thought for most folks, even though they may believe in a hereafter. They very seldom subdivide it into various cultural levels 
or make any effort to carefully map or chart it. But the, I, the problem is that while we are here, we must do what we can to please ourselves. We must gratify every habit that we can gratify, fulfill our ambitions. We must also get back at our enemies. I know cases in which an individual has carried an enmity to the uh, deathbed, and then as the last attitude in this world had had something unpleasant to say about his enemy and died with it on his lips. We never give up. And we feel that if someone has injured us, it is our divine right before heaven to dislike that person to the end of time. These kind of thoughts had a very serious effect upon our environment. They result in conditions that have gone on generation after generation. And we gradually take this pattern and tie it into the concept of destiny. It is destiny that certain things that happen. It is destiny that we shall go on living as we do and passing on a heritage of suffering to our descendants. We must fulfill the pattern of things as they have always been. And this brings the individual into a very sharp decision. Namely, the problem is, can he change? Can any individual really, basically, change their ways of life? There are people that tell us they've changed, and in many ways, probably they have. But change means not merely a new adjustment to a situation. It may mean to move out of that situation entirely. A change means that the individual achieves a social change by a personal one. He improves his family by changing himself and not his family. He improves his ethics by becoming more ethical rather than demanding ethics from others. He achieves a spiritual insight, not necessarily because he receives instructions, but because he experiences the importance of self-improvement. Change, therefore, is the one thing that can change the course of destiny. For destiny is the thing as it is, continuing to be as it is, and continuing to result in the difficulties associated with it and until some long-range program changes it. Very few people are able to make a major change in their living while in the midstream of an embodiment. They would like to, and a few in desperation try to make a change. But now what motivates this change? What motivates the desperation that causes some people to make a major break in their pattern of living. Well, one thing is, of course, disillusionment. A way of life has failed. The individual is not happy. So he tries something else. In nearly every instance, change is brought on by suffering, disillusionment, frustration, or that the individual is unable to continue in his course because of health or financial conditions or something that do, requires a change in life pattern. But this is not the way it should be done. We should not wait until change is forced upon us by our own mistakes. The individual should begin to change the moment he begins to think. For every thought, every use of the mind should reveal elements of character, conduct, patterns, associations, relationships, which can be improved, and which therefore need to be changed from something less to something better. All of this means that change is a voluntary growth, inspired by the desire to be better, and not the desire to escape difficulty. It is not that we should live well because we fear pain, if we do not, but we live well because it gives us health, which is a positive achievement in itself. Whenever we grow because we can't endure our own way, 
then there is this grudging effort that makes no alteration in our basic morality and ethics. We are simply reluctantly giving up a bad habit that we would prefer to keep if it was not so difficult on our dispositions. <laughs> we would like to make mistakes, only they become a little too painful. This results in a magnificent reformation of character. But very often this new character begins to find ways to make the old mistakes under new names. Getting around the old pattern, it starts in and repeats itself, probably throughout the rest of life. There is only one way, therefore, that destiny can be changed. Prayers to heaven to change its ways are not effective. The universe will continue, and it will do what it has always done, because that is the best for all living things. The problem man has to face is how long will it take him to recognize that nature's ways are best. One of the most common defe uh, defects we have today is our desperate desire to reform nature. We have a feeling that the time has come when we are empowered to instruct God how to operate. We are quite convinced that the divine plan needs re revamping. We know that at the present time it is a little difficulty there's a little difficulty about ourselves in relation to this plan. Therefore, we would like to explain to deity why we are right and he's wrong. We would like to make it clear that we are going to pick at him if things don't change. <laughs> so, uh, as you may remember in a little book that was written years ago called Heavenly Discourses, there was a picketing, presumably, in heaven. But whatever it is, it's man's rebe rebellion against the things that he does not like. And the moment God disagrees with man, so much the worse for God, as far as man's thinking is concerned. He must, in some way, cause the universe to go the way he wants it to go. And he tries in some ways to explain that that is also why God wants it to go that way. But it is hard to prove that God wants man to keep on forever doing things that hurt man. Disfigure his career, destroy his resources, impoverish his environment. It is in, it difficult to believe that God wants this, or that God wishes man to suffer as a result of it. Man does not suffer because God wants suffering. Man suffers because of his own mistakes. And when these mistakes come back on him, he declares it to be a misfortune. In other words, it is something that shouldn't have happened. But the cause of it has not been corrected. And as the individual continues to keep on causing trouble, he will suffer. Now, this is a good form of parental discipline. Deity no longer stands as a wicked stepfather, punishing out of pleasure or conceit, but a wise parent that realizes that every child needs discipline. So the universal plan is built upon discipline, and discipline is the one thing the average individual would like to get rid of. He does not want to be disciplined. And yet a child who rejects discipline in his teens will blame his parent for not giving it to him when he reaches 30, because he cannot live without discipline. And where he is spoiled, he is damaged. Now what we would like is for heaven to spoil us, every one of us. We would like heaven to do just what we want. We would like heaven to make happy, wealthy people out of everyone. It would do, heaven should not permit any evil to, to confront us, any problem to face us. Heaven should be a kind of paradise. Well, according to some of the old accounts, it started that way, but something went wrong. And the thing that went wrong always is disobedience. And heaven will not tolerate it. Now, heaven doesn't pick out anybody for revenge or something of that nature. Every process of nature, every moment of our own lives, we are operating within a network of laws. 
We only breathe because of laws. We only have bodies because of laws. We can only think because of laws. Every single action, thought, emotion, we possess within ourselves as faculties or powers are all under laws. Every one of them is subject to a right and wrong use. These laws tell us that the processes will work smoothly and properly if they are not abused. If, however, we disobey rules, then a whole group of faculties go out of equilibrium. The individual uh, who becomes a narcotics addict is destroying a whole group of law patterns which he needs for a successful life. He is damaging himself. No one is making him do it. We may say that he is uh, beginning at a time when he's not wise enough to know what to do. He is over-influenced by others. That is the reason why the growing person, the immature person, must be given adequate uh, discipline, parental control and direction. And this may be a very difficult job. And in some cases, it's impossible. But where this fails, then the state has to step in and complete the discipline. Because the individual cannot be permitted to live an undisciplined life and expect anything but disaster. So this is what we call destiny. This destiny this is ourselves catching up with ourselves. It's what we have set in motion finally coming back upon us the blackbirds coming back to roost under our own eaves. This problem, then, is that destiny can be changed. Destiny does not have to act this way. And the old astral theologians had much to say about this. Ptolemy pointed out in astrology that there is no inevitable destiny. There is no way in which fatalism can be interpreted into the human process. The only thing that we call fatalism is that once we have made a mistake, we must face the consequences. No mistake, no consequences. A good action, good consequences. A corrupt, negative, or destructive action, a bad consequence. This is immutable. This is inevitable and there is no way to avoid it. And it sometimes takes a lifetime to learn this, and it may take 50 lifetimes to learn it. We may come back again and again hating society because it will not fulfill our wishes. But someday we're going to learn the simple lesson that our happiness in the environments in which we find ourselves are the results, consequences, and harvests of our own integrities. These are the things that are important. Realizing this, then we can see what destiny really means. Destiny is, un, is unwritten in our uh, terminology, but it is the fact that every process that exists in nature has a reason for its existence. It is part of a perfection without which nothing can be complete. The complete, complete pattern this is the full uh, structure or archetype for our existence. Within this grand archetype are innumerable small ways of existence. And we find in the animal kingdom a good example of the very simple uh, actual intuitional factor which controls animals. We call it instinct. But animals seldom break law. They do that which is inevitable to themselves. They fulfill the archetype of their own kind. So do flowers and plants. All forms of life, even mineral forms, fulfill their archetypes. And by fulfilling them, keep faith with the principle or destiny for which they were intended. It is per perfectly obvious that if the, if the living thing 
does not mentally interfere with its own destiny. Instinct will lead it in the way it should go. Now, instinct is a very valuable thing, and human beings still have it, but only in residual quantities. Instinct is no longer the dominant with man. Man has been raised to another level, and it is this other level to which he belongs that makes him humanity. Man is not simply an animal and standing on its hind legs. Man is a creation of itself. Uh, the creation being different from all others because it has self-determinism through the existence of mind. Mind makes the human being a species of itself, not tied to any other except perhaps in the long patterns of evolution. But as a creation today, it is unique. It is unique in, because it has to change from instinct to reason. It has to be guided no longer by immutable principles operating through it. Man must direct and use these resources by conscious decision. In other words, man suddenly becomes capable of fulfilling the mystery of evolution. For evolution is impossible except to a creature that is self-governing. A creature living entirely by instinct cannot be vir either virtuous or vice-ridden. He cannot earn something better or deserve something worse because he is not a free agent. He is bound only by instincts within himself which he cannot re resist. Man, however, is no longer so bound. He has the power to use and abuse the resources of his own humanity. He is able to make good laws or bad ones. He has the right to live according to principles or to transgress principles. He has the eternal privilege of being happy, but he also has the responsibility which makes him make himself miserable. Man, therefore, is a self-motivating being, and in his self-motivation, he is moving gradually and inevitably toward the great archetype of the universe itself, which is also a vast self-moving organism, moving exactly according to law. When man fits into the pattern as one fragment of this great creation process, the moment he adjusts to the pattern and there is no inconsistency between his own conduct and that of the grand pattern, pain, misery, and suffering cease. These things all arise, these misfortunes, are always the result of the fact that man's conduct does not agree with the inevitable conduct necessary for the perfection of the divine plan. So having come to this realization, he begins to think how he can do it. Now everyone has certain tolerances, and we observe around us, and through, down through history, from the very beginning, that there have always been some who sensed this mystery, who realized that they were living in a better system than they could invent for themselves and that the most successful structures in nature are those which are built according to natural laws and are merely a specialization within natural law. Human life is a specialization within natural law. And if this specialization is by virtue of a self-resident intellect, if this specialization is unfolded properly and correctly, Humanity can live in peace and happiness in a secure world indefinitely. He can live in such complete peace that he will then be able to further develop still higher resources which he cannot work with until he overcomes the common problems of daily living. They have to be overcome. They cannot be discarded. A man looking at these problems gets all kinds of attitudes about them. He has one thing 
that he's always hoping that somewhere in nature the great laws will become sentimental and will pat him on the head and say, you poor fellow, I'll make an exception in your case. <laughs> we are all looking for this kind of paternalism. We are all trying to figure in some way how to escape the consequences of our own conduct in a universe where this appears to be impossible. So we have developed philosophies and ideas for evasion of our own responsibilities. We have not decided to earn our way out of our troubles. We have hoped that someone will forgive them and let us go sailing on our way in peace and impropriety. But it doesn't work this way. No matter how much we believe that we can break rules and still be happy, we are still miserable because we haven't sense enough to realize from experience that we cannot succeed in doing that which nature denies. So we have this thing called destiny, which we are working with, and destiny is just the plan. And the destiny plan, as far as we can recognize it in our own limited ability, is the perfection of all that lives. By perfection, we mean that every living thing, in a certain level or condition, will achieve 100% unfoldment of that potential. It will go as far in the environment as this potential requires. Now, in each environment, there is a different level of potential. The individual is not expected to achieve a condition suitable to a creature from a different environment. He is not expected to be better than the environment makes possible. But the environment in every case proves itself by the fact that living things gradually through their own conduct so discipline themselves and the environment that they achieve its final graduating mark. It, they graduate with honors when there is nothing in their own conduct that conflicts with the environment. There is no longer any part of man's human endowment that is not humanely unfolded. When he has to do something else on some other level of unfoldment, then that will be another time. But in order to graduate from this level of education, he must graduate because he has learned the lesson and turned in an adequate dissertation. He must have graduated because he has learned the lesson that this environment requires. And he can never learn the lesson by resenting it. He can never look upon this lesson as a hardship, a burden, or a crime, or some indication that God does not love him. The truth of the matter is that the Lord so loveth man that he gave him these problems to face. He expected the final product of the divine creative process is that the individual shall achieve integrity, that he shall come to grow into the likeness of the divine plan of which he is a part. Now, fate comes in with another little contribution to this pattern. A uh, man without any particular recognition of the law of cause and effect, many people talk about it, but very few live as though it meant anything, the law of cause and effect uh, does have certain relationships uh, to conduct. And when an individual makes a long-range mistake, he may at the same time cause a short-range dilemma. We do something wrong, we think it's all right. One of the reasons we think we can get away with it is because we know someone else that did. And the fellow that we thought got away from it, we haven't seen in years, but we assume that he is still going gloriously on his way. When the fact of the matter is, fate has probably caught up with him also by this time. No one can escape the fact that you do something and something happens as a result. 
Now, what happens as a result may be misfortune. But misfortune is not something that is accidental. Misfortune is something that has to be part of a plan. Now, nature in its various processes has many plans we do not understand. This we take for granted. We do not understand much of the confusion of our present day. We do not know why things have to be as they are. We do not understand why there has to be social injustice or all this type of thing. So we go out and we pick it and we try our best to present our uh, displeasures to uh, representative leaders and order them to change. But this is not the answer to anything. The answer lies that all these difficulties arise from some form of ignorance. Now, there is a common ignorance, which we all share in common. There is highly specialized ignorance, and we have to receive an advanced education to attain that type. That just doesn't come naturally. <laughs> there is a kind of ignorance that arises from uh, simply refusing to think or of having become very carefully learned in something that isn't so. All of these things affect our thinking. But whatever it may be, most of our problems arise from ignorance. And anything that is selfish is ignorant. Anything that seeks self-advantage at the expense of others is ignorant. It may be ignorant cum laude, but they're still ignorant. <laughs> Whenever we do it wrong, we are ignorant. Now, if we do it wrong because we don't know any better, that is simple ignorance. If we do it wrong and know better, that is compound ignorance. But regardless of what it is, an individual who breaks the common laws of human integrity is ignorant. And vice is one of the byproducts of ignorance. There is therefore no way in which the things can change into what we want them to be until the tendency to seek ulterior advantages is overcome. Now at the moment, a certain amount of virtue is being thrust upon us, and we're not very happy about it. And uh, there are many reasons why we should be unhappy being thrust upon us, and we're not very happy about it. And uh, there are many reasons why we should be unhappy. We are not sure what level of wisdom or ignorance is leading all this. But one thing is certain. We have for thousands of years been wrong. We have been wrong in our basic attitudes. We have been so wrong that in several thousand years we have had several thousand wars. We have the depressions and all types of financial disasters. We have had innumerable uh, inquisitions, massacres. We have had the pillaging of peoples, the destruction of properties. We have had in the present century more bloodshed probably than in the rest of history put together. And these things are all monuments to something that is tremendously and fundamentally wrong. Now as the mistakes get bigger and bigger, the penalties get heavier and heavier. If we do not correct these mistakes, there is no use shaking our fist at heaven or declaring that destiny has moved against us. The truth is we have moved selfishly and self-centeredly against destiny. And this cannot be done. It seems too bad that the human being, having been given a mind, has been so reluctant to use it intelligently. He would like to use it only to advance his own cause. And uh, we like, he liked to think of having a life in which he can do as he please, can think as little as possible, because that's a great strain on his nervous system, <laughs> and will depend upon righteous, genuine, enlightened, and virtuous leaders to do all his thinking for him. This is one of the great errors of our time. It cannot be done. So we come to an environment 
in which young people come and from which the older depart and everyone is in trouble. It looks as though we are ill-starred. Uh, we, uh, we are reminded of the fact that the word disaster means disaster, evil star. So we all think of disasters as coming from the heavens. A planet is doing it to us. But the planet can do nothing to us except fulfill what we are doing to ourselves. It can strengthen us toward the right or the wrong, according to our own integrity. There are no ill fortunes in the ordinary sense of the word. There are only lessons that have to be learned, and lessons which we resent learning. Now, the problem would look pretty bad and very sad and almost unsolvable if we continue to assume that our entire evolutionary procedure is limited to one embodiment in this world. If the one life that we live here now is the sum and total of all our opportunities to grow or become, we are really in a sad condition. We are faced with an impossible state. A great many persons haven't contacted serious thinking until they were so far along in years they couldn't possibly put it all into practice. We cannot assume that destiny can be fulfilled in 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years of human life. It is simply impossible. Destiny is as great as creation itself. Destiny moved into manifestation billions of years before the creation of our universal system. Destiny is something that extends from the infinite past into the infinite future. It is something so big that there is no possible way of capturing it completely in even the destiny of a solar system. It is much bigger than anything of this kind. Obviously, therefore, the individual cannot accomplish a perfect adjustment with processes, many of which have not yet even come into manifestation. A thousand years from now, there will be adjustments necessary which we do not even know about. And individuals will have to continue to grow into patterns that we can't even imagine. So that destiny is bigger than we are. Destiny, however, has still the same problem to confront us. Namely, that we've got to learn. And the only possible answer is that we have to think of ourselves as eternally living. We have to think of ourselves as creatures that have a destiny long enough to accomplish the perfection of ourselves. Now, this perfection of ourselves is not in order that we might uh, take a leading aristocratic part in this plan of things. Perfection of ourselves means that we shall be completely united to the divine purpose that we shall live for the fulfillment of the infinite truth and not for the glorification of ourselves. But it is also true that this requires more opportunity for growth than can possibly be captured in a single lifetime. Destiny also has to step in to regulate this on account of the relationships of living things uh, which constantly vary and change due to the actions of human beings themselves. Therefore, if we create a war and thousands of young men and women die, children and villages and towns are destroyed, it becomes obvious that those who have perished have in some sense of the word been taken out of the, of the world of opportunity to learn. They have been frustrated of their right to a life. Many of them will never have the opportunity of parenthood or maturity or the achievement of wisdom or the completion of education. And those that survive, many will starve to death or suffer from plagues and pestilences. Therefore, nature has to recognize the simple fact that in the large pattern of things, no one is deprived of anything. Therefore, the person who apparently is deprived is only deprived by our selfishness 
which fortunately cannot really touch the other person. We may try our best to destroy him, but all that we do is, is destroy ourselves. The life of this other person will go on and be perfected and completed and fulfilled just as surely as it was cut short in this embodiment. Nature has therefore the large school, and the best we can say is that our days here are merely days in school, and that each incarnation is kind of like a term or course in study. We are going to go on into the university of the infinite. We are going to keep on learning until we have learned. And the proof of the learning is that we have perfected our own integrities and perfected our own level of moral values. There is nothing going to stop us. But because of the short range of our own perception and the limiting walls that separate embodiments so that things appear here and disappear here, we are inclined to try to find justice in each separate appearance. We might be able to do that if we had a greater de degree of internal sensory development. But for the most part, we cannot. We turn, turn in only a fragment of something. And the larger pattern of that we do not see or understand. Therefore, the fragment looks dishonest. The fragment looks cruel. It looks unkind, unfair, unreasonable. But it's because we can see only the fragment. In the large pattern of things, there is no dishonesty. There's no mistake. Everything is working together for the ultimate good of all that lives. It is heaven that has to decree these things. It is man who has to accept. Now the man as he grows older and humanity as it becomes more mature gains certain insights into acceptances. Thousands of years ago there were enlightened persons a few. Some of them were leaders of our own race and kind. Others were teachers from other realms. But there were great systems in, of instruction established. Probably the most important of these systems was the system of the mysteries. These were institutions that were set up under the leadership and patronage of deities through oracles, or through sages, or through mystics, or through enlightenment and, and illumination. These systems had a key to the problem. And they accepted into their groups those that had a sincere desire to cooperate with the divine purpose of things. There have always been some who realized the facts but they were few in number in comparison to the body of humanity. And those who had the facts and tried to preach them and teach them were often heavily penalized. The individual who is ambition-ridden, who is wealth-dominated and obsessed, will turn against anyone or any system which threatens his superiority or security. So most of the great teachers of humanity have been martyred or disgraced or ridiculed and their systems have been gradually corrupted and perverted if they survived. So there has been a definite effort to block that type of thinking which would liberate the individual from the tyranny and oppression of ignorance. In some cases this has succeeded. And today, as never before, thoughtful persons are turning uh, to find solutions to some of these problems. They want to live better. They are trying to. And at the moment this effort is made, there is a distinct change in the social structure of mankind. Today, probably, there is greater emphasis upon an effort to find some working solutions than there has been in the last thousand years. And that is because the problem is bad. Is, uh, the evil uh, has come upon us and we are beginning to wonder how we can change ourselves and thereby change our destiny. This is the answer. In changing ourselves, we change all things. An effect cannot follow if the cause has been changed. 
or if there is an old cause that cannot be altered, a new pattern will transmute that old cause into power for spiritual integrity rather than merely punishment. So in a long pattern of embodiment, we have the answer uh, to the situation of the problem of fate as an evil incident, as something coming in at the moment of success to blight us, something coming in at the moment of power to cut us down. All these things are hard to understand, but they are all tied together in a concept, in a consciousness realization that is so incredible that the human mind cannot contemplate it successfully. We cannot see the interaction of millions of forces like tiny rays of light or the magnificent vibrations radiating from innumerable and uncountable atoms. Everywhere life moving and everywhere this movement a manifestation of an eternal law unfolding and growing. Like the seed growing in the ground, every plant is a magnificent testimony to a divine purpose. And when we consider all the fields of the earth, each bearing its own flora, we begin to realize just a tiny bit about the infinite diversity of life. And yet this infinite diversity of life is not a mass of accidents. It is not a condition in which some strange happenstance is responsible for the situation. It is all the unfoldment of one basic principle that will go on unfolding through the end of time. It is something we've got to tune into. It is something that we've got to discover in our own ways. And we won't start by finding all the answers. We'll start by finding one answer. And that one answer will suggest a second. And gradually over a number of lifetimes we will begin to answer more questions than we will continue to ask because we will get answers to many that now seem unanswerable. Everywhere there is a potential in the human being that is infinite. There is nothing in space that is not also within humanity. And the full unfoldment of humankind is as mysterious, as wonderful, and as glamorous as the unfoldment of the cosmos. It has to come. And we cannot find just the right words, probably, to say, why did it start in the first place? It's hard to quite figure out some of these principles because we haven't got the intelligence to do it. So now comes something else into the pattern. And that something else is faith. There are things about the infinite purpose that we cannot know at this time. Therefore, we have to have faith, which is indeed the realization of the reality of things unseen. But faith is more than this. Faith is the individual gaining confidence concerning the unknown by gaining understanding of the known. Faith is the gradual realization of the universal integrity of the plan. If the pl plan is right, then the individual has the right to have faith in it. If man can convince himself that he is a purposed being and not simply some kind of a biological byproduct, if man can realize that birth, life, death, and rebirth are great truths of existence, then gradually faith is strengthened. Wherever there is the evidence of the victory of virtue over vice, straight as faith is strengthened. Wherever we see a, a divine de dedicated purpose gaining support, we can know that faith is increased. Faith comes as the inevitable evidence of little things that we have noticed and can notice, which give us the sense of thankfulness, the realization that in some wonderful way we are protected creatures. And faith also finally gives us a large inscription upon the wall of space, namely that while we do not know it all, what we do know tells us that what we do not know is good. 
that all things are essentially right. That what we do not understand, when we do finally understand it, we will find that it is beautiful and good. That we will never come to an understanding that the universal plan had evil in it. We will never be deceived that evil arises from immutable purposes, but that evil is what it appears to be, simply a reaction to ignorance, superstition, or fear. That ignorance and superstition have burdened the race forever, up to now. And fear has made us the victim of almost every tyranny imaginable. Yet all these things are, are illusions. The illusion is the evil. Good is the reality. But we cannot quite make the adjustment to so vast a concept. So we really don't have to at this moment. If we will begin to simply accept that we are responsible agents, that we are part of something, that we are living in a universe in which we have a part to play, that we live in a, on a planet which we can help to save. We live in communities which we can lead in better ways. We are surrounded by problems of our own making, and we have the right to solve them. We have the right to do that which is necessary to correct the mistakes that we have made or which we have inherited from our ancestors. There is no fatal necessity in the stars. There is no fatal necessity in conditions as they are. Anything that needs change can be changed, but only if the individual himself realizes his own responsibility and is willing to cooperate with a higher level of ethics than, have brought, than has brought him to his present dilemma. So the universe is interested in producing the ethical creation. It is interested in producing a universe of value. It is interested in the gradual perfection of all life in order that that life may go on far beyond anything that astronomy knows about at the present time. Astronomy today is reaching out into space. It is reaching out into galaxies that we never knew existed. If we can get some bigger telescopes or stronger ones, or have greater ability at using electrical means of magnification, we will probably keep on having uh, more and more stars. And maybe we'll finally come to the edge of the whole business. And when we get there, we will have a moment of triumph until we develop the next larger lens and discover that what we have found is only one of innumerable completenesses of life so vast we can't even think what they are. And yet this is all on a level. This is all physical. What is behind it? Is the great universe of realities all by being objectified in stars and planets? Are all these little lights something that someone has lit in space? Or are they only symbols and evidences of a great order of life that is planted in space as trees and bushes and shrubs are planted on earth? What is the great earth that sustains space? What lies beyond all of this? What lies beyond the, ma the magnitudes and immensities of the physical existence? Science gradually getting more and more involved, but no solution yet. There is yet no solution for why these lights are there in the first place. We may count billions of stars, but why are they there? How did they get there? What is the reason for them? The ancients believed that the star-strewn heavens was nothing but a beautiful jeweled robe concealing the true structure and nature of the infinite. That the infinite is not an infinitude of stars or suns or moons. It is not an infinity of microbes either. The infinite is a tremendous reality 
beyond our conception. In the, in the Bible it, it says that the waters which were above the firmament were divided from the waters which were below the firmament. We are now exploring that which is below the firmament. But what lies above? What is it that from which all these worlds are suspended? What is the great light that lights a hundred million suns? We do not know. But we do sense that our own destiny goes in that direction. That when we outgrow the littleness that we know and have mastered the destiny we now deserve, that we are going to be part of this life that goes on beyond a hundred million galaxies into a vastness which we might term eternity itself. An eternity that is not darkness, then an eternity that is not death, but an eternity that is oneness with eternal life itself. That everything that we are doing, we are growing towards something. That perhaps someday we will be gardeners in a garden of galaxies. Sometime the life and light and intelligence that is slowly growing up within us will burst forth to become a hundred million suns. We do not know, but we do suspect strongly that even the smallest atom contains within it the prophecy of eternal life. We believe these things when we get concerned with them and we try to work them out religiously and philosophically. But we have trouble simply because we are unable to understand this immensity. It goes beyond anything that we know or believe. Yet in our own way, we have to cope with it. We have to find in it the answer to our own vaster perspective. That the great life, the great purpose, the great plan of ourselves is going to go on uh, to be part of this larger mystery. Therefore, the human being has an infinite future. Most people think they've had an infinite past. And the last few years of it are not particularly appealing to them. We do not know where we came from in substance, but we know that we come here not naked, but endowed with qualities and characteristics and powers and virtues and values very much more than we realize. We recognize that we have had a beginning elsewhere and an ending elsewhere will be ours. In the meantime, we are good and faithful servants here if we are wise. If we are otherwise, we're in trouble. And this seems to be the, the burden of our present dilemma, that we are simply in trouble because we are not taking a scientific, truly scientific, philosophic, religious, or ethical point of view in relationship with the common occurrences of life. You talk to someone who has just gone through a bankruptcy and they feel that fate is against them, that they are the victims of some disaster. Or they will say, as some have said to me, why does this happen to me when so many other dishonest persons are getting along well? <laughs> the uh, problem of the failure of things uh, usually breaks down. There are research patterns and projects on a number of subjects which we don't know too much about, but which have a bearing upon things. And one of these is the recurrent reality of the fact that each failure is largely responsible for its own failure, regardless of anything to the contrary. There are only two kinds of failures. Those that arise from inability to understand a problem or a profession. And the other is the definite effort to dishonestly exploit an honorable profession or an honorable business. It is one or the other. Either the person is untrained and unable to do the job, or having the training, they have decided to exploit the job for an unreasonable profit for themselves. Both of these difficulties exist. We try to co cope with the first one through education. But how are we going to educate an individual unless we give him some reason to want to be educated? A great many today do not want to be educated. 
Oh, they'll take it if they have to. But what they really want is a continuance of a charitable system in which the individual can have everything he needs and anything he wants without work. This is the idea of the true utopia. Utopia is idleness. Utopia is the individual who is not interested in labor. Now, we can say that we can prove by our civilization that people who do not like to work and do not work seem to succeed in many instances quite well. But then study what happens. Study the records. Go to a, a successful psychiatrist who is working with these people, and you will find that each individual is the source of his own trouble. Now, this we hardly like to admit, but it's healthy to admit it. And a person who has a philosophical point of view or a spiritual conviction should realize this. This doesn't mean we have to go out and hang our heads in shame. It means, however, that we must begin to search in ourselves for the causes of the troubles that beset us. And they're in there. There's something that we are doing wrong that brings this ill destiny upon us. There is something that we want we don't we shouldn't have. There is something we desire that isn't good for us. We have not as yet the courage to do that which is best. Now I know a good many people who are considered to be intelligent people, who uh, are reasonably well educated, and who are comparatively successful, who have never found out that alcoholism is a menace. If anyone tries to get rid of alcohol, they will be held up as a tyrant because every individual has the right to drink himself to death if he wants to. Unfortunately, he doesn't do this by himself always. Very often, he has an accident on the freeway and kills a lot of sober people. He also has a great many problems arise gradually until his character is so deteriorated that everything that is important in his life fails. But you can't stop him. I have had a number of them come to me in some instances where they had a pretty good philosophical background. We got pretty fair results. But where the individual didn't believe in anything, there's only one thing he can do, and that is complete the job and get out of the way. But you can't change him. Now, this is an exceptional case. And we are working nationally and internationally in the effort to curb it. But just as bad, really, as alcoholism is jealousy. And it's just as cruel and just as dangerous. And yet there is not any effort really made to change it. The individual feels he has a perfect right to be jealous. He doesn't realize what it is doing to his character. He does not realize that it is just as detrimental to his ethical life as alcohol is to his physical life. But it's very hard to change him. And it is often, in the case of jealousy, very difficult to overcome his arguments in favor of jealousy. It's very hard to give a good solid argument in favor of narcotics, but it is comparatively easy to give a strong argument in defense of selfishness. Yet selfishness is as cruel as the grave. Selfishness lies behind hundreds and thousands of miserable people. Yet they cannot change. The only way they can change and make a good deal of it is to begin to think about their responsibilities to society. The, the uh, uh, Bacon was of the opinion the simplest way of converting a uh, delinquent is to let him see what happens to delinquents. So very often we can show a person by uh, example how selfishness or greed or jealousy or libel, how these produce misery for all involved. And sometimes you can reach them they suddenly realize their own mistake. And then they change. The moment they will correct this fault, they will find that fate and destiny no longer burden them with the consequences of a fault that they have conquered. 
Now, one thing that also worries some people is that how after you have conquered a Paul, we'll say, you've really made a good job of it. You've really gotten over it. And then when death comes, uh, you lie down perhaps a little more comfortably. But what happens after that? The next time around, are you going to have the same Paul again? I have to fight it. No. A Paul once corrected does not return. A fault that has been corrected by growth, by the individual becoming more than he was before, will never permit him to become again less than he is. Once the truth of a fact is driven home, it cannot be forgotten. And an individual is never confronted with the same debt twice unless he has failed to pay it. The effort to avoid it may bring it back a hundred times until finally it is accepted, but it will never burden the individual but once, because he cannot correct the fault until he has outgrown it, and his growth makes it impossible for him to relapse. He can relapse from any attitude that he must or may develop, but he cannot relax or relapse from the condition of his own internal life. Once it is established, it is established. He may have other faults, but the old ones are finished. So we have to make only one great victory over a problem, and that problem then fades away. It is a lot like alcohol, where you can't drink again without danger of it coming back, because when you achieve this victory within yourself, you no longer want the alcohol, and it does not come back. But willpower and self-control can break down if character has not been changed. So here we are in the midst of all kinds of situations. Here we are, children of destiny. Here we are wondering where we came from and why we're here. And yet every morning on the television or newspapers or whatever our communications with the media are, we know what is wrong and we know how it should be cured. Nearly every person listening to a program can give some advice, at least to himself, as to how the matter could be improved. We say this isn't wrong because, and we have a because. We look at these things and we find selfishness and greed and intolerance and stupidity active all over the world. We know this. But we can't really change what's happening on the other side of the planet. But we can look over this mass of mistaken attitudes and see what we can find in ourselves which take on these attitudes. We can be sure that in our personal inner life we are not like acting like some intolerant nation or some fanatical faith. That we are really understanding in ourselves the meaning of the integrities. We cannot declare peace in the world, most of the time at least, but we can make peace with those close to ourselves and near us. We cannot, allow other, we cannot influence other people in their various philosophies, but we can live our own as a harmless God against mistakes and intemperances. So from the world about us, from the newspaper and the press, we realize how destinies are built. We know how those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. And we know how those who corrupt others will themselves be corrupted. We know these things, and when we start to live them, uh, we are only fulfilling destiny. But destiny is telling us this story that no matter what others happen, what others do or how they act, the just person stands firm in the law. And through the justice of his own integrity, he gains the courage to face the future with a good hope. Out of justice within his own life, he becomes increasingly aware of the dignity and glory of divine justice. And he also discovers that but justice is for the most part a mask. Even divine justice is a kind of mask. But behind the face of justice is mercy. 
always mercy. The eternal plan is merciful because he protects in the long run all good things. It is merciful and ever-loving because it will not permit hate to destroy anything. Things will suffer, but hate will finally die. And the individual who bear the hate will come into the fullness of love, understanding, and integrity. So we live in a world of great principles, and uh, our destiny is perfection. Our destiny is to recognize the fatherhood of divinity and the brotherhood of humanity, and to live all things in peace. This is the destiny. And we will continue to kick against the pricks until we recognize this. And then, as we begin to smooth out our own relationships with destiny, we will find that fate becomes more benevolent. Good fortune is more common. For there is actually no possibility of good fortune apart from a noble life. Anything that seems to conflict with that is an illusion. So with these kinds of thoughts, we can perhaps get an idea of the magnitude of a plan, a plan that is simply beyond us and our understanding. We don't have to understand it. The child doesn't have to know all about where its parents learned wisdom. The child can have faith. And because the parents love the child and the child loves the parents, there is a communion and the transmission of a previous experience becomes a beautiful event. And it is this transmission of experience from one to all, from each to the others, that can be the most wonderful experience, the most wonderful event in all our lives. And in this way, we can become more and more servants of destiny. And as a reward, we will enjoy the most propitious, relationships with life. And if things become difficult, we shall also have the ever-present consolation of faith that all things will work out for good. If we can live in this way under these principles and in this consciousness, I think many things will be solved in the lives of each of us. Thank you very much.